Greetings everyone, Rob Chastner here, continuing in our study verse by verse through the book of Jeremiah. And if you're following along, we're in chapter 38. Um, life is filled with all kinds of choices, and the choices which we make, we will take those choices and results on into eternity. We are given a certain number uh, of, of amount of time and physical ability and clearly a person who only lives to be age 20 likely is going to have less accountability than a person who lives to 100 and so the next time you're praying for another year of life remember you're also praying for another level of accountability what's amazing is you will find two different people in identical situations, um, uh, one will make wise choices for themselves and someone will make foolish, another would make a foolish choice. And so we certainly have the same thing going on as we get into this study beginning in chapter 38. Remember that the entire city of Jerusalem is surrounded by the Babylonian army. The city is about to fall. It has been under siege for about a year and a half. And inside of the walls, you have Jeremiah. You also have King Zedekiah, a man who is absolutely easy to hate because he has no moral compass. He has no backbone in his decision making. And you've got many other people who uh, we will discuss in this lesson who will weave in and out of this historic event <clears throat> some of them will make good choices and some will not and so what we are going to be able to see here that where, whether or not you make good choices it has no bearing on the environment uh, you find yourself within if you make wrong choices you cannot say it is due to your environment because I am sure that if you look far enough, we could find someone who was in the identical situation, and yet they made better choices for themselves than you are doing. And that is what we see in this lesson. So we start with um, names of some of the leaders. Uh, they were corrupt people. They were attempting to hold on to power that they possessed. They get wind of what Jeremiah is saying, and they don't like it. All right, so uh, press pause now and uh, read verses 1, 2, and 3. Uh, I'm going to have a link in the box below this video if you don't have your Bibles that you can click on to. Otherwise, press pause, read verses 1, 2, 3, and then press play once again. So again, the message from God has not changed. They are here at God's bidding. The Babylonian army is being used by God to judge Israel for their idolatry. God is saying, open the front gates, walk out with your hands up, wave your white flags. And if you will do that, the Babylonians will have mercy upon you. They will not kill you. And they're going to spare your city uh, from disaster and harm. Just surrender. And so when the leaders hear what Jeremiah is saying, now they respond. So press pause and read verses 4 through 6, and then press play once again. It is understandable why these leaders who would want to hold on to their power would say to the king, look, Jeremiah is bringing down the morale of our troops. I'm sure that there were plenty of troops who took heed and left the city in an attempt to escape, believing that Jeremiah was truly a prophet sent by God. So we can see the point, or uh, their point of view, uh, on the morale of the troops diminishing. Notice that Zedekiah, the king, says, what can I do? We are dealing with a king who is a puppet. He has no moral compass. He has no backbone. Um, He's a man who was influenced by the stronger of the personalities that interacts with him. And so Zedekiah could, could, could say no, but that is not his nature. Uh, he says to these leaders, 
do with him what you want. So they, they take Jeremiah, they lower him down into some sort of cistern and they begin to sink in the muck and the mire. Uh, it's interesting that it doesn't tell us just how far he sinks. Was it to his knees or to his shoulders? We really don't know, uh, but it looks like it's pretty deep. Uh, uh, remember, these guys have a desire to kill Jeremiah, so likely he was putting, uh, put in very miserable conditions. They're not feeding him, and likely he will starve to death if something doesn't happen to cure this. Uh, they're likely thinking he will weaken, he'll slip off, uh, and he'll ultimately drown. A very cruel and barbaric way to treat somebody, but understand that this is what happens. Uh, this is what happened to him simply because he was being faithful to, uh, to God. All right, press pause, read verses 7 through 10, and then press play once again. It was very common with these Mideastern kings to have uh, harems, uh, and guarding their harems would be several uh, eunuchs. Likely, this would have been a man who was castrated at a very young age. Historically, Ethiopian eunuchs were highly prized. Government leaders would give gifts to another government leader to an Ethiopian eunuch, uh, you know, one king to another king. Most of them were very tall, even though they had been castrated. At a young age, uh, uh, to to eliminate their testosterone, but apparently their bodies were able to develop with muscle mass, so they had a tendency to be tall in stature and extremely strong, and their personalities seemed to be gravitating towards the cruel. Um, and so, these uh, these guys, <coughs> because of their size and strength. They were just uh, the kind of guys you would want to guard their harem. No, and then and this guy in verse 7, uh, Ebed Melech, is uh, not his name, but rather it's a title. This is a compound Hebrew word uh, translated as slave uh, to the king. And so this is the king's slave. Um, and so you can see how this king could drive you crazy. They come in and say, hey, we need to do something about <clears throat> Jeremiah. And the king says, okay, do whatever it is you want. And so they throw him into the cistern. And then this guy comes uh, in a very forceful way saying this is evil. This isn't right. And the king responds, okay, great. We will take care of this. The king changed his mind. Uh, by any any uh, uh, force around him. All right, press pause now and read verses 11 through 13, and then press play once again. <clears throat> Pay attention to the fact that this guy not only is kind to Jeremiah, uh, had this eunuch not gotten involved in the process, Jeremiah would have died. Not only did Ebed Melech rescue Jeremiah, but also notice the tenderness by which he rescues him. No doubt that uh, Jeremiah was weak, uh, likely on the verge of uh, starvation. And this guy understands that Jeremiah does not have a lot of meat on his frame and this rope would be cutting into his skin. And so with kindness and consideration, he makes a harness from old clothing uh, from the palace to pad the rope as he's being hoisted out of the mud. And so, you know, there'd be incredible suction that would resist from him coming, being pulled out of the mud. Uh, and so this guy cares. He's got a great deal of sensitivity, and he's kind. I right, press pause now and read verses 14 through 19, and then press play once again. This is very interesting. Many of the Jews are leaving the city. Uh, they get the big picture. The Babylonian army is outside of the front gates. They're having um, been. They've been there for 
over a year attempting to break through the walls and the gates. It's only a matter of time. And so many of the Jews are thinking, maybe Jeremiah is right. We need to get out of here. And we essentially have joined, uh, they have essentially joined the Chaldean uh, uh, camp. And now the king is saying, I'm afraid of these people. Isn't it interesting? This king is not afraid of God. This king is not afraid of Babylonians, but he's afraid of the Jews. In other words, these, this guy sees himself above these other Jews. And if you put them out there, they will turn to me and blaze, uh, blame me for uh, everything. And then where will I be? All right. Uh, press pause, read verses 20 through 28. 20 through 28, and then press play once again. So again, we're able to see <clears throat> that this king is not much of a leader. He's very intimidated by these strong-willed underling. And so he says, I would like to keep this in confidence. Remember earlier on, Jeremiah said to the king, please don't send me back to the prison, uh, because if you do, I'm going to die there. And here the king is saying to Jeremiah, tell me Tell them some of the truth, but not all of the truth. Keep it in confidence. And so it seems that here we have Jeremiah in the role of a counselor. Uh, uh, um, and he does keep this uh, confidential. All right. Now we're moving over into chapter 39. Press pause and read verses 1 through 2. And then press play once again. All right, so this would have been 588 BC. This would have, this would be um, um, in verse one, and then in verse two, this would be 586 BC, about a year and a half, uh, one and a half years that the Babylonian army was working to get through the city walls of Jerusalem. Um, all right, press pause and read verses three through ten, and then press play once again. This, no doubt, was a political move on the part of Nebuzaradan. Uh, 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 you have got this poor, uh, you've got the poor who have nothing, and now all of a sudden you're giving them vineyards, you're giving them land and fields, and these are the people whom you're leaving behind. And why would they stir up trouble if they have just been enriched? This was nothing more than buying uh, votes uh, or buying the peace. So uh, the great tragedy of all of this is it didn't happen. It didn't have to happen. For over 40 years, God's word had faithfully been given to the people, which said, if you will simply do this, in other words, repent and turn to God, then the horrors which God is predicting will not come to pass. The saddest word in the entire world, uh, the saddest words I should have listened. When a person is looking at their destroyed family, their destroyed bank account, their destroyed relationships, and they're looking back and saying, I wish I would have listened. Don't you think that when Zedekiah was watching his sons being killed right in front of him, and then his eyes being gouged out during this experience of those traumas, don't you think, well, gee, I wish I would have listened to Jeremiah. I wish I would not have feared the people, but rather I wish I would have feared God. But if I fear God, none of this would have come upon me. Uh, none of this would have happened uh, or come upon Jerusalem. All right, press pause now and read verses 11 through 14, and then press play. So we're going back in time here, just... A little, uh, just a little bit, beginning in verse 15, uh, because what appears to have happened is, as you have these people defecting out of the city, no doubt they are going through some kind of debriefing. They're probably being inter uh, interrogated for what intelligence they can offer. And we have all seen pictures of this, you know, with this barbaric horde at the base of the wall and you have guys at the top of the wall shooting arrows at them. Um, so uh, as they were interrogating these guys, they were probably saying, well, what 
what is the morale inside? And they're likely saying, well, there is this guy. We, we think he's a prophet. He's telling people to give up. And he's saying this of God. He is saying that you guys are sent from God and God's hands, uh, uh, hand is upon you. And so this information eventually was received by Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar is likely thinking this guy, Jeremiah, needs to be rewarded. So the captain, the guard, is told to find Jeremiah and to give him essentially a blank check to do with whatever he wishes. Now, we go back again a little bit in time. Uh, press pause and read verses 15 through 18. Now, how this happened, when this happened, uh, is this the only convert of Jeremiah? We really don't know. Uh, yet, isn't it interesting that we have these two characters here in chapter 39, where you have Zedekiah, who was given the word of the Lord over and over again. He resisted. He was afraid of everybody and everything except God Almighty. And there we, uh, here we have this other guy uh, whom... Um, we never would have known if not for Jeremiah chapter 39. And so he puts his trust in the Lord. He confronts this unstable king. He lays everything on the line, resulting in Zedekiah dies. And now God is rewarding this other guy. All right, that puts us in now to chapter 40. Press pause, read verse 1, and then press play once again. Apparently, what happened here... Jeremiah was freed, the prison was emptied, then those who were healthy enough were chained together and apparently stay, uh, here is a staging area in the city of Ramah, or Ramah, about five or six miles outside of Jerusalem, likely an administrative nightmare. There you know, were hundreds and of thousands of people, likely a chaotic scene, and this guy has just been given orders from the greatest king in history outside of Jesus Christ, of course, um, uh, and his orders were to go find Jeremiah. So there is a, a, a search going on. There is asking everyone, where is Jeremiah? Have you seen Jeremiah? And so finally, some of the prisoners who made, made it to Ramah, uh, they find Jeremiah there, and this captain of the guard releases Jeremiah. Uh, and so while he's in transit, they realize that this guy... Um, this is the guy that they had been looking for. I press pause and read verses 2 and 3, and then press play once again. So he's telling this to Jeremiah. <clears throat> um, you know that you are in trouble when a pagan tells you you're, you are supposed to be the children of the Lord. You know that you are way off of track, okay? Press pause and read verses, verse 4 and then play once again. So he's telling Jeremiah, I have got this great retirement package for you. You can come with me to Babylon. I will personally see to your comfort. Uh, but if you do not want to come back, I will understand. Just pick a place you want to live and I'll make it happen. I right, press pause, read verses 5 and 6 and then play once again. So Nebuzaradan, no doubt, was a smart guy. After all, he is the captain of the guard. He has the trust of Nebuchadnezzar. No doubt he is able to read facial expressions and body language. And so he says to Jeremiah, come with me to Babylon. I'll take care of you. You don't want to go to Babylon. Then go anywhere you wish. And maybe Jeremiah is a bit torn, not wanting to offend the hospitality of this man. And maybe this guy can see that Jeremiah is conflicted. And so he makes it easy for Jeremiah. He says, just stay here. Now, this was a wise move because the enemies of Jeremiah would be able to say, if Jeremiah did go back to Babylon to finish the rest of his life there in luxury, uh, they would say, well, we told you that Jeremiah was planted here in Jerusalem by Babylon. We told you that Jeremiah was not from God. It was just a ploy to have a surrender. Uh, no doubt this, that, uh, that it was necessary for Jeremiah to stay in Israel for nothing else than to protect his reputation of being sent by God. Not to mention in Babylon, there is already 
other prophets there, such as Daniel and Ezekiel, and you don't need another prophet. The people left behind Israel need Jeremiah, so, um, uh, or left behind in Israel need Jeremiah. So Jeremiah goes with uh, uh, Gedaliah, who is the son of uh, um, Ahikam. And you remember this guy was who was who saved Jeremiah earlier in the study. The leaders wanted to kill Jeremiah, and Ahikam um, stepped out and stepped in and said, "No, this guy has done nothing that we should put him to death." And so, if Gedaliah was anything like his dad, uh, he was fair and honorable, and likely why Nebuchadnezzar. Put him in charge uh, after the invasion. I press pause, reverses seven and eight, and then press play again. So this is like Robin Hood. He had a band of rebels, a band of guerrillas, uh, that when the Babylonians came into the land, some of them fled to the hills and the valleys. And so uh, word has now reached them that the war has come to an end. The Babylonian army has pulled out their offenses. Uh, and Gedaliah is in charge. It appears that even the local people have a lot of confidence in Gedaliah. And so these, band, this, these bands of men who have been hiding out in the wilderness, they come now to Jerusalem. I press pause and read verses 9 and 10 and then press play once again. So Gedaliah says, this is a done deal. Don't fight these people. I'm going to do, I'm going to dwell here. Uh, we will begin to put the pieces back together. We have a limited government now, a local government. Lay down your swords and pick up uh, your blow shears uh, and begin to make an honest living through our agriculture. Let's uh, uh, weather the storm and see what God has in store for us. I press pause and read verses 11 and 12 and then press play once again. So we can imagine this was an abundant harvest because you have a great diminishing of the population who uh, who, uh, uh, who were taken captive back to Babylon. You, you still have the vineyards and the orchards, but you have a much smaller population. So everything is in abundance. When the Babylonian army started to attack and uh, were marching down through the northern Israel borders, Many people left uh, to go to other countries, but now the word's getting around that Babylon has finished uh, the war and, the re and returned home, and so many of these people are returning back to Israel. All right, press pause and read verses 13 and 14, and press play once again. So this is not the report of just one guy. You have all of the captains of the forces who return to him in verse 8. Uh, uh, are plotting here. Gedaliah uh, is a nice guy, but seems to be a bit naive, um, uh, or perhaps he is just so optimistic by thinking nobody is going to cause trouble. After all, Babylon just destroyed this place, and, and I am Babylon's guy, and so if you take me uh, and I am backed by Babylon, uh, anyone attacking me is going to have to deal with the Babylonian army. So likely it never occurred to him that anyone would attempt to kill him. We should never underestimate the stupidity of man. If he would have been a wise individual, he would have likely started an investigation or perhaps established some kind of a guard for himself. I right, press pause, read verse 15, and then play once again. So they are saying Gedaliah is the one of uh, is the one the people have confidence in. He is the glue which holds together this new administration. And if you are taken out, uh, this will destroy the entire nation. So they are telling Gedaliah, you need to take this seriously. You have got responsibility here. It's not like they will kill you and that they will uh, that that will be the end of it there are going to be ramifications of your death. All right, verse 16, press pause and read that, and then press play once again. Okay, so in the following chapters, we will find that Ishmael is in the line of David, and Ishmael is likely thinking, 
I'm in the line of David, and so I'm the uh, one calling the shots. It should be me, and maybe the Ammonite uh, king was trying to stir up some trouble because it is likely that the Ammonites would love to see the Jews in turmoil, and uh, they were likely using this as a political gain, but yet it is very likely that Ishmael wanted the throne for himself. So we have to understand the big picture this is the beginning of the times of the Gentiles. The Bible speaks of the times of the Gentiles. When Gentile powers are in control of Jerusalem, uh, the times of the Gentiles continue today, and this will continue until the one true king returns once and for all, at which point the times of the Gentiles will come to an end. It's important that we focus on the exhortation that is given here to Gedaliah, which is this. If you want to be stupid, you want to be reckless with your own life, that is one thing. But the, there's, it's another thing if you want to take into consideration um, what about all the people in your life whom you are responsible for. If you are a parent, a grandparent, a Sunday school teacher, if you have other people in your life who are looking to you to be an example, there is an enemy out there who wants to assassinate you or your reputation. There is an enemy planning your fall. He is planning your demise. Now, human nature can have us be self-confident or naive. Uh, that's foolish. We must take this guy's counsel. It is not just important for you, but rather it's important for your kids, your grandkids, your students, your friends. It's bad enough that you fall, but what would be the ramifications if you fall, who will also fall and fail that's following you. So Gedaliah is a great guy, wonderful administrator. He has done wonderful things. He's the glue which holds together the administration of Israel. But he is being advised, do not be stupid, do not be naive, because even though the Babylonians are, have pulled out, there is still spiritual warfare there's still an enemy out there and even though the enemy of the cross was defeated for you and for me he is still working he's still at work he is still planning our assassination so focus on living your life wisely do not be gullible do not be filled with confidence self-confidence do not be filled with arrogance Without the Lord, I can do nothing. Cast yourself upon the feet of Jesus and be wise. Amen. All right. I hope this has been helpful and informative. And uh, our next study uh, will be uh, Jeremiah chapters 44 through 46. Thank you for viewing and good day.